Would you take your scriptures and would you go with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Ruth, towards the front of your Bible? That's where we're going to be be this morning. What movie or book would you say is the perfect story? And now some of you are maybe thinking like Gladiator or Braveheart. And there may be some of you, you're thinking more of like the notebook, let's be honest. And some of us are somewhere maybe in between, but often those stories, those movies, those books that we enjoy reading or watching, for it to be the perfect story, it's got to have love and passion. And, and for a guy, there's got to be some kind of tension or fight. Well, in our book, in God's word that he's given to us, there is a story that's considered the perfect story. And it's the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth begins with this, wait, what moment? Because there is this woman, this Israelite woman who is a widow and she returns back to her homeland, Israel, with her Moabite daughter-in-law, who is also a widow. That's a wait, what moment? Then you have in chapter two, you have this Moabite woman named Ruth. And through a series of shocking events, she finds extreme favor from one of the wealthiest and most respected men in the community named Boaz. And then in chapter three, it gets even more steamy, if you will, because Ruth, this Moabite woman, she makes a move on Boaz and Moab, Mo, and then Boaz makes a move to promise to marry her. But there's another man in the picture. Sounds like the notebook. And then in chapter four, we see Boaz and Ruth, they marry and they have a son and Naomi, Naomi is thrilled. And this son, his name is Obed and he becomes the grandfather of King David. And if you know your Bible, you know who comes from King David, amen? King Jesus. And so this is the story of Ruth. And it's an exciting story with its ups and downs and its twists and turns, but it's not just for our entertainment. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 15, he tells us the books like Ruth were written for our instruction so that we would see this perseverance and that through those stories, you and I would be filled with hope. And so friends, as we study the book of Ruth, part of its purpose is to give you hope. And so if you need hope, I wanna encourage you to dial in as we look at this story together, as we engage it over the next several weeks, we're going to look at this book together and we're gonna really focus on the, the five main characters in the book of Ruth. And since the book is named after her, we're gonna begin with Ruth, who is described as a woman of excellence later on in this book. But let's begin with her and let's ask this question because it is a crazy story. How does a Gentile, end up being the great grandmother of King David. How does that happen? This Moabite woman becomes a part of the lineage of our King Jesus. Well, it begins with food or the lack of it. Look with me at verse one. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to reside in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. Ephrathites from of Bethlehem in Judea. So they entered the land of Moab and remained there. So from the very beginning, we learned there is a shortage of food. And this shortage of food drives this family from the promised land to the land of Moab. And Moab, its origin and its reputation is shady. It's shady. This Moab, kingdom of Moab, is not good. Their origin begins, we find, in Genesis. 
And we find that there is a man named Lot, the nephew of Abraham. And Lot, for fear of his life, he goes with his two daughters and he goes and he hides out in this cave. And scripture says that his daughters are concerned that they're not gonna be able to find the husbands and carry on their name. And so they come up with a plan as sisters. And their plan is to get their father drunk. And they get him drunk and then they sleep with him. And the oldest daughter gives birth and his name is Moab. That's the origin of this kingdom where this Hebrew family goes. And Moab also has a terrible reputation. There was a time when God's people were about to enter the promised land and they began rubbing shoulders with Moabites. And in rubbing shoulder with these Moabites, some of the Moabite women, they entice some of the Hebrew men to worship the gods of Moab. And they do. And because of the rebellion against God, over 20,000 Israelites die of a plague. And it's important for us to know the, the reputation and the origin of Moab because it's just an amazing picture of what God can do despite where you start. And so they travel, travel to Moab, but then in Moab, we're going to see that tragedy strikes. Look with me in verse three. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons. And they, were, and they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one of them was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then both Malion and Kilion also died. And the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And so if you are hurting this morning, for whatever reason, something going on at work, in your marriage, in your family, and you're hurting, Naomi knows what it feels like to experience hurt and lost. She's lost her husband, and now she's lost her two sons. Tragedy strikes, but good news arrives. Good news arrives. The author tells us in verse six, then Naomi arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the land of Moab because she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them food. And so here we see where there was once no food in Israel, God has provided food. And one of the fascinating things about this story is Bethlehem means house of bread. And in chapter one, at the beginning, we learned that there was no bread in the house, but now God had visited his people and there was bread in the house. And so Naomi is going to return to her homeland, we read. And somewhere, somewhere outside of Moab, there is this debate between Naomi and her daughter-in-laws. We're not sure exactly, but they're on their way. And all of a sudden there's a moment and they stop and they debate, which I would have loved to see in this debate between this mother-in-law and her daughter-in-laws. And the mother-in-law says, I want you to return to Moab. There you can marry Moabite men and have Moabite babies and worship your Moabite gods. And both the daughter-in-laws say, no, we're sticking with you. And then Naomi says to them, listen, listen, I, I have no sons for you. Even if I were to get married and have sons, would you wait for them? It's in your best interest to return to your homeland. It's best that you don't come with me, Naomi pleads. And the scripture and the story tells us there is weeping and there is crying, which just shows the affection between this mother-in-law and her daughter-in-laws. But then after debating, we're going to see that Orpah, in verse 14, kissed her mother-in-law and she returns to her homeland. But then look at verse 14. But Ruth clung to her. Ruth clung. This word clung is the, the same word that's used in Genesis chapter two 
when it talks about a man leaving his father and his mother and being united, clinging to his wife. It's that kind of relationship that Ruth had with Naomi. She says, I am with you. I am taking hold of you. This expresses their relationship that they had. But notice, Naomi still, Naomi still doesn't stop. She, she says in verse 15, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Re- return after your sister-in-law. And then we have one of the, the most beautiful passages, definitely in Ruth, in the Old Testament, maybe in our entire Bible. In verse 16, but Ruth said, do not plead with me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you sleep, I will sleep. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me. And worse, if anything but death separates me from you. In this interaction between these two ladies, we see in Ruth fierce loyalty. Fierce loyalty. She leaves her family. She leaves her mother. She leaves her father. She leaves her friends. And she clings to her mother-in-law. She says, I am with you. That is fierce loyalty. And we see her loyalty in chapter two, in chapter three, and especially in chapter four. After Ruth gives birth to her son, there's ladies in the community. They're looking at her newborn boy and they're looking at Naomi and they say to Naomi, Ruth loves you. And Ruth, they say to Naomi, Ruth is better to you than seven sons. Ruth had fierce loyalty. But she also, friends, has a fierce faith. She said, your God is now my God. Your God is my God. So there was an interaction there where Ruth gives up the gods of her family and she turns to the God of Israel. She turns to Yahweh. She turns to Naomi's God. So Naomi's faith had an impact on Ruth's faith. And Ruth says, your God is now my God. And so what we see, Ruth is this woman of great loyalty and great faith. She clings to Naomi and she clings to God. And so here's a question just to put in front of us this morning. What are you clinging to? What are you clinging to? Maybe you need to follow the example of Ruth and let go of the gods of the day and cling to the God of the Bible. And what is fascinating to me is is in, in Ruth's actions, we see what Jesus was talking about in the gospel of Luke. When Jesus is talking about what it means to cling to him, he says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Ruth let go of everything to cling to God. To follow Jesus, he says, we must let go of everything and give our allegiance to him. And so if there is an individual among us who you have yet to cling to God through the person and work of Jesus Christ, we beg and plead with you to do that today. Follow the example of Ruth and turn from your former gods and turn to the God. And after Ruth gives her speech to her mother-in-law, I love what happens next in verse 18. It says, when When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her about it. The mother-in-law just yields. I give up. Come on, you're coming with me. And here we have this Moabite woman 
going to live in the land of Israel, the promised land. And God is going to use her in a tremendous way. But there's a couple of next steps just to lay before us this morning. First, this one's for our our young men, our single men. And this one's simple, find a Ruth. Find a Ruth, amen? Young men, single men, find a Ruth. Find someone who is loyal and find someone who is faithful. So young men, wherever you are, single men, wherever you are, find a Ruth. And then for the rest of us, whether we are moms or whether we're not moms, whether we're male or female, may we be Ruth-like. May we be Ruth-like, whether it's at work or whether in our neighborhood or in our very own home, may we be Ruth-like and demonstrate fierce loyalty to one another and fierce faith to God. Fierce faith and fierce loyalty. May we be Ruth-like. Imagine if our marriages practice this. Imagine if our marriages practice this fierce loyalty. Imagine as a church if we practice, and I was waiting for that to happen. (laughs) And I think I'm okay. I think I know the rest. (laughs) Imagine if we practiced this as a congregation with one another, this fierce loyalty and this fierce faith. May we be Ruth-like and young men, single men, find a Ruth. Now, I left an important part of this story out and I wanna draw your attention to it back in verse one. Back in verse one, we read that this was the time of the judges. And this gives us the context of what was happening in the story of Ruth. Ruth is not an isolated story out here by itself. No, Ruth is a part of a bigger story. And we read that the story of Ruth is taking place in the time of the judges. But the time of the judges for Israel was like the dark ages. It was like my middle school years. (laughs) It was a very dark time for Israel and her people. Matter of fact, their reputation in the book, the end of Judges, the the very last verse, is that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And what they were doing was not right. They were rebelling against God. They were worshiping other gods. And God had to bring judges and, and these deliverers to try to bring them back. But what I love about this story of Ruth is in the darkest moments of Israel's history, shines Ruth, it's good bud, shines Ruth. In the dark ages of Israel, Ruth shines. In the midst of hardship and trial and death, Ruth shines with her loyalty and her faith. And so maybe you can relate to Ruth. Maybe you feel like you're in the middle of the dark ages, getting something going on at work, students, maybe something going on at school, something in your very own family, and you feel like you're in the middle of the dark ages. I wanna encourage you to shine like Ruth by being loyal to those around you and by being faithful to a God who loves you. And what we're going to see in the story of Ruth is that God is going to use Ruth. He's going to use her loyalty. He's gonna use her faith. And God is going to bless her, but not only her, he's going to bless her family and not only her family, but God is going to bless you. And so may we shine like Ruth, amen? Would you please just take a moment with me to pray as we prepare to celebrate communion together. And so as you're sitting there with your heads bowed bowed and your eyes closed, I'm just reminded there was another moment of difficulty, a dark time. But the scripture says that God sent forth his son born of a woman 
to redeem his children. And so just like Ruth shined in a very dark period of time, the Bible says, into the darkness, a light has shone. And that light, friends, is Jesus Christ. And we wanna take a minute to celebrate his person and his work. How he was light amongst darkness. But the Bible says that when you take part in communion, when you take part in the Lord's Supper, that we can actually do it in a manner that is unworthy. And so to participate and receive communion this morning in a manner that honors God in a worthy manner, we're told to examine ourselves. And so I wanna invite you to examine your own heart this morning, examine your mind, your actions, your behavior. Is there something that you're clinging to that's not God? And so maybe this morning you need to confess that. Is there any other unconfessed sin that you can share with him? Maybe for some, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. And so Father, we do thank you for how you used a Moabite woman and how she shined in the darkness. And so as your people, may we do the same. And we do thank you for how Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so we wanna take a moment, Father, to celebrate what you have done through him. We wanna practice what the scripture says, and that's to proclaim his death until he comes. And so spirit of the living God, would you prepare our hearts and our minds for this moment? In Christ's name, amen.